Hi everyone, apologies I can't be there today. Um, my name's Louise, I'm the Business Development Manager for the South Coast Centre of Excellence in Satellite Applications. So we're an organisation um, that's part of the Satellite Application Catapults Regional Programme. We're funded by UK Space Agency and we're hosted at the University of Portsmouth. And Adrian's asked me um, to provide just a, a short video outlining some of the areas where AI and machine learning are being utilised in space and where there could be opportunities. So I'm going to focus on some of these developments and trends and um, the ones that I think are quite important. Now, this isn't intended to obviously be an exhaustive list, but really just a kind of taster. So the first area I want to uh, touch on is mega constellations. I'm sure you've all seen in the news that the variety of launch activity that's been happening and some of those are fairly significant. So SpaceX, um, by the middle of this year, have already launched about 1,600 satellites as part of its constellation. We've got OneWeb, which was acquired by the UK government. Um, and by the end of next year, we would expect to be seeing about 650 satellites. And then we've got Amazon's Project Kuiper. They're, they're a little bit further behind, but they're intending to have a, just over 3,000 low Earth orbit satellites um, being launched. So all of these are predominantly focusing on global connectivity and you know providing internet um, via via satellites so really really substantial activity going on and where uh, ai really does come into its own is around the satellite operations if you like so things like the relative position things like communications and certainly uh, end of life as well so if as i move on you know space actually it might seem a bit kind of counterintuitive particularly around the earth is fairly congested uh, here we've got an image provided by ESA as part of their space surveillance work. Uh, and so you can see there's an awful lot of um, debris uh, that's currently orbiting the Earth to various sizes, uh, and which has the potential to pose quite a lot of challenges for us. Um, and really what we're seeing with AI and machine learning is, is kind of two areas. The first is around debris removal. Uh, so ESA have already got a mission um, plan called Clear Space One, where they're going to be using AI-powered AI cameras and robotic arm to look at removing debris. And then what we're also seeing is, is the requirements around traffic management, if you like, which is, you know, how can we move our satellite assets around in a safe way uh, with, you know, minimal requirements for, for kind of um, propellants in a fairly congested environment. Um, so really is about kind of that tracking, that modeling um, and, and that kind of intelligence about that activity. So quite a, quite a challenge there, but certainly one of interest. And, it, and some other areas where we've seen AI already being deployed. The first is around AI assistance. Um, so as more and more um, activity happens off Earth, uh, we're seeing AI assistance being used, uh, for example, in the ISS um, for things like, you know, looking, monitoring sensors, uh, providing information to astronauts, uh, even reducing astronaut stress. So um, this example here is CMON, but we're, um, NASA already have uh, another one called RoboNaut um, under development as well. Then as we move on to lunar and planetary exploration, um, there's already been work done uh, by NASA in collaboration with uh, Intel about looking at the lunar surface and using lots of, well, millions and millions of images to train AI, AI to create a, a virtual moon map, if you will. And this is certainly gonna have importance uh, for the future Artemis missions. And then early uh, kind of middle of last year when, um, Perseverance landed on Mars, that was empowered by the AI-enabled terrain relative navigation system. So that really, all of these remote operations, these autonomous operations are heavily dependent on AI machine learning for success. So that was just kind of a few areas of kind of looking up, if you will. Now I'm going to look down. Um, so Earth observation, one of the things that's really been um, happening significantly over the last probably five years or so is um, the importance of Earth observation data, uh, how it can be utilized, particularly commercially, 
and so what we're seeing is a lot of providers have also improving some of their instrumentation so that we can get kind of sub 30 centimeter resolution. So th these data sets uh, are creating far more opportunities for using AI machine learning uh, for things like change and object detection in particular. So here we've got a, a 30 centimeter resolution image from Digital Globe. It's of a port. And we can already be able to make out, you know, various assets like, uh, you know, you've got kind of the, the lorries there, the different aggregates, uh, the containers on the left hand side. So it really is utilizing this imagery to, to look at kind of operations on Earth. But by and large, because we've got all this improving resolution, we've got all these, you know, much larger numbers of assets going into space, what that the what that's really doing is giving us such an overwhelming amount of data. I mean, just as an example here, this is uh, an image from Russia's uh, weather um, satellite Electro L1. Uh, this is the 121 megapixel image and it collects images like these every 30 minutes of every day. Um, each kilometer is, is effectively one pixel uh, and it collects uh, those in two bands. Uh, apologies for the dog. Uh, so, so uh, you know, so one asset creating an awful lot of data. When we look at the Copernicus and the Sentinel program, um, that alone is producing 10 terabytes of data every day, huge amounts. And these are, you know, if you look at the spectrum of satellites here, these are intended for various different types of um, uh, measurements. We've got sulfur dioxide, for example, we've got uh, surface temperature and, and, and vegetation um, monitoring. So such a broad range of, of applications, but such a huge amount of data that needs to be integrated. It needs to be um, processed, but it also needs to have other data sources brought in to, to make kind of intelligent decision making about that. So lots and lots of opportunity there. So going um, a little bit further in terms of this data um, challenge, SCFC and, and NERC, they fund the Center for Environmental Data Analysis. And um, this particular archive has 13 petabytes just of atmospheric and, and EO data. So it's freely available, um, but the, this is an archive that has data that goes back to the 1980s. So when I talk about change detection, you know, there's a huge amount of information available there um, with which to, to, it really can't be done in any other way than utilizing AI and machine learning. So I'm now gonna move into just a couple of examples. Uh, firstly, uh, this one's actually a COVID related example. And this is really about, um, in this case, measuring lockdown. So on the image on the left, uh, we've got the Epcot Center uh, in January before the COVID restrictions. You can see the car parks are very, you know, quite, quite full. And on the right by March 18th, when operations had shut down, there's no vehicles. Um, so essentially what I'm trying to obviously show here is that, you know, the power of being able to detect those changes from space and how we can use those images to really feed in uh, information to, to various organizations about operations that are happening. Um, so, you know, various decisions can be made. Again, another COVID example, this is around supply chains and Orbital Insights did some really, really interesting work here. So they were, they essentially used AI to um, look at car detection. They also looked at um, uh, lorries and trucks entering the uh, manufacturing site as well. And essentially what they were doing is using those as proxies for uh, manufacturing um, capability uh, and the actual supply chain. So how much of those medicines were being produced and therefore, you know, how was that then going into the you know, effectively the supply chain and were there any kind of challenges and issues? And actually what they saw obviously was a significant ramping up of activity. So that information is really important, um, particularly uh, in the pandemic for kind of government organisations to be able to kind of look at what's available and where there might be gaps that need filling. This example 
isn't COVID related, but I think it's a very, very interesting one. And this is, is using not just uh, remote sensing data from satellites, but also combining it with other things. So in this case, uh, uh, kind of vegetation indices. And this is obviously very, very powerful for kind of looking at crop yield, which obviously has uh, relevance for farmers, um, for uh, the food supply chain, and perhaps even for humanitarian um, issues. So if you're looking at the, the problems around potential famines and things like that. Um, so really, really uh, interesting kind of examples. So I just want to wrap up, um, but before I do, I just want to highlight a couple other examples. Like I said, this is not an exhaustive list, but very, very, um, I think it's very important to see the diversity of what we're seeing uh, in terms of AI being applied to um, EO data. So the first is around economic activity. So that's looking at things like car density, construction rates, import, export operations, which may or may not be involved you know, with ports and things like that, and using those as, uh, to support measurements around economic activity. Um, we've seen AI being used to look at uh, monitoring oil tanks and in particular looking at shadows from the, the floating lids and then using that to be able to estimate the volume of oil that's available and then that information is being fed into particularly the, the finance industry. Health and well-being. So it was a very interesting project uh, done by Ordnance Survey where they were asked to look at uh, access to green space. Um, that hat was in particular reference to uh, COVID and looking at lockdown behaviors or whether they, you know, those restrictions were likely to be followed. But equally, that information is really, really important for looking at the health and well-being of, of a population. You know, can they get to the park? Do they have a garden of their own? Um, and even bringing other data from, from space around kind of things like air pollution. So really, really important for the health and well-being of society. Another example is precision forestry. So rather than the very manual way that we've looked at for us before, um, satellite data and AI is being combined to look at things like the diameter of trees in a forest, their, you know, their height, their species, their health. Um, and obviously with some of these archives that stretch back over some time, we can also look at potentially, you know, the age of some of these um, forests and provide all that information. So this is really, really important, particularly if you're thinking uh, in, in relation to deforestation. Then the final example I have is around property value. So we've seen a couple of companies that are looking at um, combining AI with, with satellite data, again, looking at the size of property, looking at the roof materials or um, the location, are they near to roads or parks? Um, We've also seen other companies use kind of similar information, uh, but looking at deployment of electrical vehicle um, infrastructure. So, you know, where are the driveways, where are the lampposts? So some really, really interesting um, angles there, which show the power of, of AI and machine learning applied to this earth observation data. Um, that's it for me. I, it was just a whistle stop tour, but I'm always happy to talk about the space sector at length. Um, so if you know you have any questions, queries, or want to find out more, you can um, contact me uh, or Adrian would be more than happy to share my details too. I um, hope you enjoy the rest of the session. Thank you. Goodbye.